Welcome to Roundtable Mindset, the podcast where we seek to understand and share different perspectives in order to grow and challenge our own. And we encourage you, our guest, to do the same. Each week, we will pick a topic to discuss sharing our own unique thoughts and insights. There will be times when we won't agree. And let's be real, that's probably going to be most of the time. And that's okay. We feel it's important to understand that we can live in this polarized world and still respect one another and even be friends. Well, hello, and welcome back to Roundtable Mindset. I'm Jamie. And I'm Malin. And we're here again. It's nice to see you back here today. Or hear you back here today. Um, you know, uh, not too long ago, we talked about the long week being like a blur or a skid mark. This week was not, it was a blur for me. So <laughs> it was fast. It went fast. I'm in between big projects and I'm gearing up for a new one and kind of rolling off of a, another one. And so, yes, there's a lot on my plate. So I can, I can appreciate that. Yes. Uh, it's a, it's a fun time of year. We have a lot going on at my, at my work too. So it just makes it busy. But it's good because it just, uh, it does, it keeps it busy. And anytime the week goes fast, it's usually because I'm super busy. So that's good. It's good for me. So, um, well, today we're going to start out with our food for thought, Malin. And I think you have something for us today. I do. And I, it's kind of a different way of looking at something. And I need to give a little bit of a background to where this question's coming from before I ask you, Jamie. So just to give a little bit of context, last week I had a meeting with my boss and we were talking about um, different goals that the teams need to, our, my team need to achieve, things we're, we're doing to personally grow our skills. And the amount of work that's coming over and that we're responsible for is growing, as I'm sure everybody else is. And so, he was talking about the different types of mindsets that we should be engaging. And so he wanted to make sure the team didn't feel like this was a perfection mindset that we had to be a hundred percent on a hundred percent effective hitting it, you know, hitting everything out of the ballpark a hundred percent of the time, but he was looking more towards a growth mindset. Mm -hmm. And with that, what he meant was, um, you know, it's okay if you, don't always hit hit it out of the ballpark. It's okay if you fall and stumble, you make mistakes, things don't go as well as you have planned. As long as you can pick yourself up, dust yourself off, learn from it, and then apply those learnings, you know, future forward. So then maybe the project gets done a little easier. You don't fall into that same trap again. You know, lessons learned kind of mentality. And I love that so much because that's exactly where I think a team, um, Again, I work in IT and I'm not going to bore everybody with the details, but that type of mindset works very well in an IT world because we're constantly trying to innovate and fix and improve and enhance systems for our business partners. Um, and so you have to have a certain level of you know, experimentation that goes with that because if you don't, you'll never discover new things. You'll never discover a brand new way of, of fixing a problem or you know, using artificial intelligence in a different way. And so I really like that, uh, that mindset. But one thing that came to mind as he was talking is I was, I was kind of looking at it, trying to look at it differently. And that's where my question comes from. My question is really, Jamie, have you ever stopped and celebrated your failures? We talk a lot about all of our successes and we talk about all of the milestones we hit and all the things that we accomplish. But have you ever stopped and, and celebrated your failures? What a great question. Um, you know, I consider myself a pretty emotionally intelligent person and I can stand here and say, no, I do not celebrate my failures. <laughs> um, um, I am not ma emotionally mature enough to celebrate failure. Um, but I do think, um, I love that you talk about like growth mindset 
Um, because the opposite of growth mindset is a fixed mindset, right? And so I think um, I think something that I have learned to do is to look at those failures and really stop and um, and reflect on them and process them so that I don't I don't necessarily frame them as a failure anymore. You know, I look at it as an opportunity that I had to learn something, um, an opportunity that challenged challenged my abilities and and sharpened me. Um, I don't necessarily call them failures. You know what I mean? Um, there's a quote. Oh gosh, I can't remember. I don't know. It was probably on Facebook or something. <laughs> but a quote that said, "I have not failed. I've only." I've only found a thousand ways that didn't work. Right. So the idea is, is that, you know, you, you try these different things and what works works and what doesn't doesn't. And so, um, I can't, I can't say that I can celebrate a failure, but I can, um, and do often try to practice the idea that that failure isn't a failure. It's, um, you know, it's a step in the learning process and in the growth process. If that makes sense. It does. But I, and I think that's, I think you're doing exactly what I mean when I say celebrating a failure, because it's not about, you know, giving somebody a high five and said, Hey, that's completely crashed and burned. I think what you just said is it really encapsulates what I'm talking about, about celebrating failures is that how many times growing up, um, you know, you, you do something and that's wrong. You need to do it this way. Um, I think we talked about in one of our past episodes, somewhere between being a kid and thinking you can do everything to suddenly you've learned that you're not good at anything and you almost stop trying somewhere in that process, I think is when we start understanding not to celebrate our failures, which means what I, how I am trying to, to kind of say that Jamie is I like to stop and see the things that I didn't do very well for no other reason than to learn from them. And so many times grown ups, the people I work with, we don't even want to recognize that we've had a failure because there's such a negative connotation with it, right? Like you failed, that's bad. Don't talk about it. Mm-hmm. And so for me, celebrating the, the failures is recognizing there's a failure. Sometimes a failure, although is painful, is a good thing to experience because through those failures is where you grow. If everything was always perfect for, for you or for me, I would not, ex- I would not grow nearly into the person that I am today. And that would be a travesty. So when I say celebrate the failures, you've literally just, you just gave every great example of what I was talking about. And I would say, I would challenge you, Jamie, that you do celebrate the failures because it's about recognizing them. It's about knowing we're not perfect and that's okay. And it's about learning from those mistakes, taking those calculated risks to say, I don't know how this is going to end, but I'm going to take a risk And if it doesn't pan out, at least I have the learnings from it. And that is a win in and of itself. So I would say you are celebrating the failures, at least the way that I was intending that question to be. Well, and, you know, I think another piece of that, too, is to learn to give yourself grace when you do bonk it on the nose, right? Like to be able to step back and be like, okay. And I think that's probably the piece that has made that a struggle for me over the years is the the ability to step back and say, you know, this isn't because you were not good enough or you weren't smart enough or whatever. This is, this is a process or a step and you're growing and you're learning. Um, and to give myself the, the space and grace to, to accept that and to be okay with that. Um, And that's probably the piece that took the longest (laughs) for me to figure out was how do I give myself the space and grace to learn and grow? Thankfully, thankfully I'm out of the cartoon movie stage with my, with my children being young adults now, (laughs) but the Incredibles is really like where that was explicitly put in my face. You know, when, um, when the kid, I don't even remember, remember what he was trying to do, but he was trying to make something. And the whole family was like, that's amazing. What's your next try going to look like? You know what I mean? Um, and that was really the first time that I had really explicitly seen that put out in that way that made it super accessible and, and really then started adopting that in, in teaching my children, you know what I mean? To, to give themselves the space and grace to learn from, you know, the things that didn't work out the way we had hoped it would. So 
Um, yeah. And, and I will say that in my personal life, um, it's probably a little bit easier because I control the majority of that environment mm -hmm. where it's a struggle is at work. Um, you know, thankfully I'm on a team now and I have leadership above me, um, and support people around me who are, who are investing in that growth mindset. And so we are stopping and celebrating the, the failures. And I have leadership who, um, celebrates with us and says, yes, you know, that, that didn't go the way we wanted. What are we learning from it? How are we applying it going forward? But, you know, great job trying. Good thing you're thinking outside the box. You know, having those people that don't want to take the time to have you fail and learn from it are the biggest enemies of that growth mindset. And everybody, you know, in my professional, professional life is always like, you need to think outside the box. We need to be innovative. Well, you can't be innovative and not allow people to fail and um, learn from them. Uh, one of the greatest terms I've heard is fail forward and fail fast. Have you ever heard of that? Mm -mm. So it's, you're trying, you're using, you know, what, again, you're being, you're not just throwing caution to the wind, right? You're taking in the information that you know as of right now. You might not see a clear path, but you're making a, an educated guess based off the information you have. And so instead of waiting and trying to analyze more and try to get more data and, and more analysis done so you can make a 100% concrete decision, you just say, hey, I have 75% of this information. I think this is the right path. Based off of that, I'm not going to wait. I'm going to go forward. And if I fail, I'll fail fast, but I'll fail forward because now I know the path that I went down was the wrong one. And I know now which one is the right one. And that to me was a very powerful concept to understand. Um, and again, at work, I can't control my environment 100%. And so if I'm, if I'm in a, an organization that doesn't support that, it's very hard to, to do that. Um, but thankfully I'm where I'm at now. They really, um, they really encourage us to do that. And again, last week was just a reminder for my supervisor and, and it kind of made me think about all those different things. And this question came to my mind. I was like, I want to ask Jamie if she ever celebrates her failures. So. Well, yeah, that's, that's awesome. And you know, you're making me think about how, uh, at my work, at my work, we do things to try and, you know, build each other up and celebrate the successes and things like that. And now I'm going to think about ways that maybe we can celebrate the challenges <laughs> rather than um, rather than just the successes. That's awesome. So so uh, today, today we have a topic for do we have a topic for you? <laughs> <laughs> We have a topic of all topics. Yes. I'm super, I'm, I'm actually really excited to talk about this with you. I think, um, so today we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about abortion, but we're going to talk it talk about it in a different way. I think, you know, so yeah. much. Yeah. I think, I think it's, I think exactly. I, I think it's important that we say, okay, whenever you hear the word abortion, everyone right. just kind of shuts down right. because we have heard the arguments back and forth. Right. And I, I think we've talked about this too in our, you know, growing up past lives we were exhausted with the topic even before we even got out of high school. And that's been a couple of years ago at best. Just a couple. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I just wanted to hop in there when you said, a, you know, the word abortion, I was like, hang in there because this is, I think this is a very different and unique perspective to that very tired topic. Yes. Yes. We've all discussed, we've all discussed abortion. Is it right? Is it wrong? You know, should it be legislated? Should it be decided on by state? Should it be federally protected? Um, you know, we've we've exhausted all of those. But today we want to talk a little bit about um, about paternal rights when it comes to abortion. And I think you have a pretty unique um, perspective on that. So um, what kind of well, and truthfully, when you and I talked about this, this was something that you're pretty passionate about about talking about. So. Um, tell me a little bit about your thoughts in this area, Malin. Yeah, and, and Jamie, I'm going to have you keep me on the straight and narrow because this is a very, again, abortion as a umbrella is very hard to talk through. And everybody, like you said, has their stance. Is it right? Is it wrong? For me and in this conversation, I want us to make sure we focus on, uh, you know, the dad rights in all of this, because, um, as you mentioned, that's something I'm very passionate about over the 
you know, the years now. And, and I don't want to, I don't want to put a negative shadow on this, but I, I want to highlight the differences when I say this mm-hmm. for years now, we've heard the, the controversy about, is it, you know, is, should it be legal? Should it not be legal? Is it right? Is it wrong? And again, we can talk about that, but I really want to focus on the one voice that I never really heard in any of those conversations is, and I, I never really heard anybody ask, which is where, what does the father think? You know, the, there's a very loud voice coming from, you know, the female side of the equation, the mom side of the equation, all saying, um, you know, what they believe and what their right should be and how, you know, they should get a dis- to decide. And, and they're, they're really, their voice is really important in that decision making. But never have I ever heard somebody stop and say, well, what's the dad think? Where's the father in all of this? It's a very interesting perspective that's missing and it needs to be part of the equation. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, again, personally, we can go round and round all, all day long, but when we're talking about this piece in our conversation today, that's where my biggest questions are. That's where my, I just can't wrap my head around why the man or the father is not part of the discussion around, uh, around, um, the abortion process. If it's okay to get a, a woman to get an abortion without the consent of the father and, that's where that's where I want to focus this conversation mm-hmm. is to really start understanding, unpacking it, because I don't think anybody's talking about it. I don't think anybody's even stopping and caring what the dad or the father has to say. And I think that is that is a travesty. Well, and I do you know, you you know very well that I have some pretty strong opinions about this topic. And so I even in our conversation, it is the one piece of the conversations that you have, you and I have had that have gotten a little heated here and there um, that, that does make me stop and think for a second, like this is something, it is something to have a conversation about. It's something to, to think about and, and really, really see, um, see if I can learn something new uh, from a different point of view. So, um, you know, I guess, do you know of, um, do you know what that looks like currently? Um, is there, is there law, is there legislation in some state somewhere that has recognized a a father's rights when it comes to, um, abortion policy? So I'm not going to say this statement that I'm about to make is all inclusive because again, um, have I spent weeks and months looking into this no but i think where all good research starts is a good google search right like go to the internet see what i do do the google's Um, teaches me a lot (laughs) and and i think that's where all research begins now i think that's just the age we live in and so i will tell you this far or this much uh jamie when i put in the topic of father's rights and abortion in my google search literally one thing came back and I have to say, the contrast that kind of showed up on that screen when I saw one thing back, I can't even tell you how many years it's been since I put anything in the web browser and only had one thing come back. You know, you usually can put in, you know, anything and have lists of stuff that the internet will pull back for you. And that was shocking in and of itself. But I remember reading this, this one piece that came back and it said, and I'm going to paraphrase, but it said there are there are currently no laws or legislation in the United States that grant basically prevents a woman from having an abortion without the consent of of the father or the man. And I thought that was very. I thought that was very sad, and I thought that was very um, eye opening. That that was really the only information that came back in my search. So I I I honestly can't say that. I went down any further research to do within the internet because mm-hmm. again, starting with Google, that's the only thing it gave me. And it was pretty cut and dry. Um, the way I interpreted that was no, there, there is, there are no laws. There are, there's no regulation. There is nothing protecting an unborn child from the father's lens. In fact, it's almost like the dad's rights don't even begin until after the child is born. Mm-hmm. And, and again, when we're having this conversation, I know we're going to slip into our different viewpoints and I'm expecting that, 
<laughs> but when you're talking about a child forming and isn't ready to be born yet, there's still that idea that that is half that has been contributed by an, a, another person. It's not just the the woman's DNA. It's not just the material from the female. It's also the material from the male. And in that gestation period, there should be some recognition. There should be some rights protecting the father to say, hey, I still need to be consulted or talked to, or even, you know, maybe it takes two signatures to go forward with any kind of procedure. But I got to be honest, Jamie, I didn't find anything anywhere that even remotely touches on that or says that. You know, I'm having a hard time believing, though, that this hasn't been brought up somewhere at some point. You know what I mean? So it makes me wonder um, why, why hasn't there been like policy, um, public policy about this um, with everything, um, everything involved in, in this topic specifically makes me wonder why. And I guess the only thing I can think of is um, if you have, if you have a baby that's been born and a, and a mother decides they do not want to parent baby, then the father can take, take over those responsibilities and move forward. However, however, if a mom decides that she does not want to continue her pregnancy, there's no way for a father to take that piece over. So in some part of my, some part of my mind is like, okay, well, this makes sense to me that until uh, until there is a physical child, um, that, you know, how, <laughs> how does that, because if you disagree, then somebody loses, you know what I'm saying? I, I do. And I know what I'm about to say is, is going to hit, oh, I'm expecting it to hit your ear harshly. <laughs> but... Thanks, thanks for the pre-warning. This is a trigger warning from Malin for me, guys. <laughs> Not a trigger warning. Um, it takes two to create a child. It needs to create. It needs to have two to basically destroy that child. And what that's going to do is that's going to it flies in the face of the movement that I'm I'm hearing a lot, which is you know, a, a woman's body, her, her body, her choice. Well, this flies in the face of that because as a dad, um, there's only so much involvement before the baby is born that I can be part of, but that doesn't mean that I shouldn't have some rights that protect that from the gestation period or during the pregnancy of the woman. And yes, I, I understand like if the woman's like, I don't want this child and the, the, the father does, the father cannot take over that pregnancy. So I would even argue that is why it's even more important that we start hearing these dads and, and starting to give rights to fathers and pass legislation and start going down the path of recognizing that a dad's voice isn't and shouldn't be granted to him just when the baby is born, but also protects that child, you know, as it's growing, as it's developing before being born because i think a, i think a husband i think a man needs to be involved with the care of of the child before birth i think they need to have some awareness because i you know i i'm sure it happens all the time where there's sometimes a man's not even aware that that he is a father or is going to be a father and so when i was sitting down and thinking through all this jamie one of the things that i it kind of answers your question before which is why haven't we heard about this why hasn't this been talked about as I think it probably has, but I would also believe it's probably squashed just as fast because, again, it flies in the face of that movement, which is my body, my my choice. And and really, it's not because it's not the baby is not just the woman's. And so that's where I feel like this this movement probably doesn't get a lot of airtime or a lot of focus is because it does go right in the face of, of that one that quite honestly, you know, we hear all the time. We, I, I hear it constantly. And yet I don't hear anything from the man's point of view or the dad's point of view. You know, I think the, I think the thing that, um, what the listeners don't know about me yet 
is that I am an avid Grey's Anatomy fan. Like been watching since the very first short summer season back in, I don't even remember how long ago it was because it was a long time ago. But 1985, I believe it started. Oh, shush. <laughs> It wasn't. It wasn't 1985. Um, but I do remember that my children were small enough that it could be my guilty pleasure because they were in bed already. So <laughs> it was a long time ago. But um, they actually kind of dealt with this topic um, when um, Owen and Christina. So any of my Grey's Anatomy fans out there, you guys are going to know who this is. Malin, you probably have no idea. But Owen and Christina um, are surgeons and Christina ended up getting pregnant and um, had the entire show, it was pretty clear that she had no interest in parenting. She had no interest in being a mother. Her, her baby was her career and she really wanted to focus her whole life on that and, uh, unexpectedly got pregnant with her husband. And, uh, they spent a lot of time in the show kind of, um, tearing this, this issue apart. And, um, and I remember, um, I remember being surprised at how I felt for Owen <laughs> as he was really struggling with this because he really did want to have a family. He wanted, uh, he wanted to, to be a father and to have kids and to throw the ball and, you know, um, and, and to have that as part of his, his life, um, but chose to marry someone who did not want to have that as part of their life. And they ended up not working out because at the end of the day, they wanted different things. And um, so, so this is something that I have thought about before um, in, you know, like television. I, is it is it television emulates life or life emulates television? You know, I never know for sure. But, you know, as I got to watch this play out um, in these characters, it was a uh, it is something that I've thought about. Um, at the same time. It's. I would hope, for instance, I would hope if your wife had um, a fatal Oh, not even a fatal disease, but had something that required her to make a decision. Um, for instance, you know, let's say a breast cancer gene. And so do I go ahead and have the mastectomy so that I don't, um, so I don't run the risk of having breast cancer in the future? Or do I take my chances and fight as hard as I can if that happens, right? I would hope that in your relationship, that would be a decision between the two of you. And I would also hope that if you were in a position as a dad, um, an expectant dad, that you would have a relationship that you could have that conversation and you could have some influence in, in what the outcome was. But I think the hard thing is, is that we can't legislate um, that dads will be involved in kids' lives. And we have a large amount of single parents, single moms who are doing this on their own and who don't have the support of, of the, the other party to help them make this decision and help them care for a child and help them provide for a child long term. And so I, I guess I, I see the perspective. I see where you're coming from, but I don't know... Um, I don't know how practical it would be to try and legislate that. You know what I'm saying? I do. And I, and I've thought about this again, and there's going to be situations across the board, right? There's going to be, I mean, both sides of this discussion, there's going to be examples where it doesn't work. And, you know, you're, I'll, I'll, I'll start with your analogy with, you know, the relationship that I am. You're right. We would be able to talk through it and we would, ha we're like-minded. And so we would want the same outcome for the child. I guess for me, what I'm looking for is if, in your example, um, let's say the woman wants to terminate, but the man doesn't, in today's world, there's nothing protecting the rights of the father. Nothing. In they that, literally are they are literally handcuffed and watching that unfold. In that same type of example, though, if I have a breast cancer gene and my partner does not want me to have the preemptive mastectomy, it is still my choice in the end. Well, right, because that's your that's your health, that's your body. 
it's a pregnancy is not just a woman's body. There's there's three people that are involved in the pregnancy. There's the male who helped place the genetic material in order for the pregnancy to begin. There's the um, woman who is housing the genetic material. And then there's the genetic material or what I call the baby itself. So it's not just a woman's body that we're talking about when we're talking about this topic. Your example, it is. It is 100% your body. It's 100% your procedure. It's 100% affecting your health. In this discussion, it's affecting three people. And so it shouldn't be one person's voice as the only voice to make that decision. Well, except at the same time, no hospital is going to um, go hunt down a father of a baby that was born with no father sitting there. That baby is going home with mom. So mom has no choice in the matter. Mom is going to be responsible for baby. And dad gets the choice. Am I going to be involved or am I going to ghost? Am I going to be gone? And so I do think that that makes it a little different in that, you know, well, well I mean, you think about, um, I, I know if I birth a child, I know it belongs to me, right? We don't necessarily know who the dad could be, but it belongs to that mom and that mom is ultimately going to be responsible for it um, unless they choose otherwise, but again, with that argument, so if a woman just doesn't say who the father is, then she has 100% rights over controlling that child. And then when the baby's born, she goes, JK, I think this is the father, puts the name on the birth certificate. And then all of a sudden that father is now strapped with the financial responsibility of maybe a child he never even knew about. And, and that's at the heart of what I like. That's what I want to get to. I am not for big government in any fashion. But I think in this particular case, I think there are things that we can put into place that could help with alleviating some of this. Um, you know, I think going forward, if abortion is um, is a part one of the alternatives, then I think there needs to be some regulation and some laws around that protecting both the the father and the mother. And so I I would propose and I would get behind. Um, some sort of legislation that says two signatures are required to terminate a pregnancy. You need the mothers and you need the fathers. That's not practical either though, because I mean, what if, what if some random guy is like, okay, I'll, I'll pretend to be the baby daddy and go sign the paper for you. Or what if, um, are we going to make a, are we going to make a mother carry a baby to term so that there can be genetic testing done? Or are we going to start doing genetic testing in utero, which I think is a danger to the baby? I'm, I'm no doctor, so I don't know this for sure, but I can only imagine that if you're trying to get genetic material to do a genetic test, and then so you spend the entire pregnancy trying to t chase down a dad. Yeah, so they can actually do, um, and anything that you do to a child in utero is a risk, right? Right. any kind of testing you do. Um, when my wife was pregnant, there was testing that, you know, we opted out of, but we could have had done to understand if there was any kind of, um, I don't want to say deformities, but you know, um, they, they, if they could test if they had an extra chromosome, if there was going to be a potential for down syndrome, if there was going to be diseases, we opted out of all of those. That was our decision. Um, but I know even it's been well over a decade ago, they were doing those types of things. So I can only imagine that's gotten probably better. And probably more sophisticated, and so I think that that could be um, that could be an answer to those questions of how do you how do you determine how do you prove, and you wouldn't want some rando to come in and sign that. So again, like I said before, on both sides of the of this discussion, there's going to be things that have to be worked out. But at least with this one, it would cause there to be uh, the the dad's voice would at least be recognized as being needed or you know being wanting to be heard or needing to be heard it's n it's no longer just a man waiting to be allowed to be a father it's more of a uh, hey i want i have a, a voice here i want to be able to be heard and i understand what i'm saying could also mean that if both parties want to terminate the baby they would still be able to terminate the baby 
But in the instance, instances that maybe a dad doesn't know or a dad doesn't want to terminate the child, it would at least give a little bit of a roadblock to say, hey, we need there to be a meeting of the minds here because you can't do one without the consent of the other. Does that make sense? It does. I guess, you know, to me, I think, I think because of the amount of investment um, that a woman has in, in having a baby, um, part of me, not part of me, that is a big reason why, well, let me just put this out there. Ideally, a child is going to be conceived in a committed relationship where both people want to be part of it. That it's a conscious choice that two people have made that they are ready to make a baby and raise a baby and, and, and all of those things. Um, lots of reason for lots of reasons that isn't always the case. And, and because of the amount of investment that comes from a woman in, um, in having a, a baby, um, I, I think, yeah, it would be great if the dad is on board. It would be great if they could make that decision together. But if they can't, I would hate to see someone spend months trying to um, track down a person for a paternity test or, you know, all of that <laughs> to to be able to make the decision that that she chose to make anyway. Um, so there are some big kinks to work out in, in policy like that. Um, and, and I almost, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't even see how that's a thing. Now I appreciate your perspective in saying as, as a man, I would want, I want to say in that I want to be able to, um, I want to have some influence in that decision because I'm invested because you're invested. That isn't always the case. It's, I mean, I don't, I don't know what the statistics might be, but maybe we're not hearing a whole lot about this because it's not as big of a deal for guys who are in this situation. It's a big deal for you because you're invested in your kids and you're invested in your family and it's important to you. Um, but I don't know, maybe it's not talked about a lot because it's not a big deal for people who are involved. I don't know. Well, it, it, and yes, I understand that. And in to your point, you know, my wife and I, we talked about, you know, all of the pregnancies. We were on the same page for all of the pregnancies. And I guess for, for me, the way I'm seeing this is this is a little bit different than just proving, you know, paternity of a child, because when, you know, in, in today's, if I can just kind of think beyond myself for a second, if a woman is going to have a child and she doesn't know who the father is, or she thinks she knows who the father is, but the father is denying being the dad of the baby, there's a lot of effort that has to go into tracking down who the, the dad is mm -hmm. and trying to prove otherwise. Right. In this case, it's almost like the opposite. It's the opposite saying, if you were wanting to terminate the pregnancy, then you need to go and try to find the, you know, the father and get his sign off on the termination of the pregnancy. So for me, it's almost thinking of it the other way of saying, how many times would that really happen? How many times would a woman decide, hey, I'm going to go and terminate this child without the consent of my partner? And to me, I think this is a start to start recognizing that there are rights beyond the woman when we're talking about pregnancies. And it starts protecting and starts recognizing and starts saying, yes, there are, there is another person involved who matters just as much as the mom that they should be taking into, a, you know, their thoughts and opinions should be taken into account. Because as I said before, it's not just the woman's body. It's not just the woman's pregnancy it's also part of the man's. And so for me, I'm thinking, if you're going to terminate this life that's growing, then that number I'm assuming would be a lot less than trying to prove the paternity of a father for someone who wants to keep the child. And so again, takes two people to bring a child into the world, it should take at least two, two people to take 
the pregnancy out of the world. You know, the only the only thing that I keep and this I'm going to I'm going to be transparent with you, Malin. This is kind of a different conversation. Just this is a difficult conversation for me just because I am trying to keep those right and wrong arguments out of this. Right. Like those those things that we always go back to that we hear so much about. Um, and I know that every situation is unique and that there are a hundred different scenarios that might lead a person to make this choice. Um, but what if, what if the, there is a health concern, uh, for, for the mother, um, that it is, it is, um, physically detrimental for her to continue the pregnancy, um, either, Oh, I I don't know. Again, I'm not a doctor, so I can't think of any medical reasons that that would need to happen. But let's say that this is a situation that the woman is in and they, she doesn't, she can't find the dad. She can't find the man who provided the other half of the genetics needed to, to create this baby. Um, so we can't, we can't proceed with, with the procedure because we don't have the other the other signature on the sheet. So then we're putting her life at risk as well because of legislation that further exerts male control over a female's body. I'm just saying. Well, I know you, I like how you slid that in there. So I'm going to answer the first question and then we can get to the second one. So the first question is, and it's going to be a hard one and I understand hate mail is probably going to come, but there's never any legislation that's going to be 100% perfect. There's never going to be something that we can, as humans, implement that is perfect, right? Other than let's just take off the board, you know, everything in the world because well, we just can't find, we can't find one solution that's going to solve it. So, some states seem to think that it's okay to legislate this. So, so, well, I'm just saying, so to answer your original question, no, she wouldn't be allowed to have the procedure. If, oh. if what I'm saying is that, so no. And that's, you're okay with that. And, yes. Oh. And I'm, I'm okay with it because it should never be just, it shouldn't be just one voice making a, that, that um, decision. And as hard as this might sound and as harsh as this comes across, but there's also part of me that thinks that if there is an underlying health concern for a woman that having a baby, then again, Things happen. I and I can appreciate that, but there should be some consideration that goes involved before having some of those. Ah, she should join a convent. No, but she should know the risks. Well, of course and she knows like the any, risks. Let's say well, she took all the every precaution she possibly could have, and she got pregnant anyway. And then, she, in my world, she would need to have the fire the father sign off. So she suffers pregnant. the consequence and dies for her choice. <laughs> we all have to have, live with our consequences. Malin, we do, Jamie. What we can't, oh, we cannot goodness. live in a world where we can absolve everyone from their responsibilities or the risk that they take. I mean, we all do a it procedure every could day. a procedure that could save her life, but. There's not a man to sign off on the form. See, now you're getting me fired up here. <laughs> right. Because you're looking at it from, because it's a man. No, it's because it's the father. As much as we want to sit here and say that it's the woman's right, it's the woman's body. It's not when you're talking about a pregnancy. It just isn't. 50% of the material was given to her by a man. So as much as you're sitting here saying a man's controlling the pregnancy without a man, there would be no pregnancy. If her life so is at risk, the baby is not going to survive anyway because she is well, going, well, you don't know that if she, if she dies, then if, if she dies, oh my goodness. if, I mean, you just said it yourself. So we're, we're hedging bets now that if something would come to pass, that we're protecting ourselves from something that we don't even know, even in your own example, is something that could come to pass. Again, why, why the is father's voice needs to be in there. An, an unborn fetus, the value of an unborn fetus who may not be able to survive outside of that mother's body is more valuable or important than the woman who's carrying that baby. Like how, how is that? My goodness. I'm really surprised how, by that, Malin. <laughs> how are you, val why, why are you putting a value? Why is it, why doesn't the woman, why isn't she as valuable as 
the baby she's carrying and the man that helped put the baby there. Why are you giving different values? Well, the man isn't going to die. The man will be just fine because as we have established, the man gets to walk away if the man chooses to walk away. The dad cool. does not have to be involved. However, the mom does have to be involved. And to to deny her a life-saving procedure... By killing another. I mean, and, and again, that's where we're touching the... the, the yeah. The, the, See, that's the, why this, <laughs> this conversation I mean, I mean, is tough because of that. But Yeah, because we're touching that, right? Because uh -huh. I want to dive into that just as bad as you do. <laughs> because I'm like, wait a minute. Because we're here. But again, uh, yeah, because we're like kissing it and I'm like, let's dive in. But... But that's just that's that to me is it like we're we're saying there's a potential for a, a life to be lost. So let's go ahead and and 100 percent terminate a life. Alleged. But let's do that. No, listen, but let's do that irregardless of where the other person who helped create the life, their voice or their opinion. That's where I have concern. That's where I have a problem. A piece of legislation does not have a medical degree that can make a medical decision to decide that this woman will be, will not live if she continues this pregnancy. Okay, I Jamie do not feel that those, those decisions should be made by legislators. Those decisions should be made by a doctor. Now, if you're telling me maybe there should be some sort of a, um, Maybe there should be some sort of a loophole in the law that says that a doctor can sign off saying this will be this will be detrimental to the mother's health and well-being, her ability to live. Then a doctor can make that decision with the woman alone. Maybe, maybe I would feel differently about that. But right now, as you're telling me that, no, nope, you can't find the dad. Too bad. <laughs> like, oh, my goodness. Well, and, and again, <laughs> I'm going to poke the bear. So just let me get this out. <laughs> so go ahead and sit up. I'm, I'm going to hit poke. mute. Mute. Yes. So, you know, you said earlier about a man deciding on a woman's body. Well, I wonder how many male doctors would have to be able to say that that's medically necessary. So again, at some level, you have a man still telling the woman. Oh, wait a minute. It's possible. Well, just a second. I, that was me poking. But let me get to yeah, the other part of it. It doesn't even okay? make sense. Just, it does. Blech. <laughs> But here's the thing. Doctors are not perfect and science isn't perfect. And we've witnessed that probably more so the last couple of years without getting into it. We all know what I'm referencing more than ever. And so I have a story, Jamie, and I know you know this, but our listeners don't. So I'm just going to I'm going to share it really quick so they can understand where I'm coming from. I think doctors are educated individuals, but they do not have all of the answers all of the time. My sister um, tried for a long time to get pregnant and it was very difficult for her. And then finally, um, her and her husband were able to conceive, uh, twins. And right away, uh, my sister dealt with a variety of health issues and sicknesses and, um, nutritional problems. Uh, one of the, uh, the, the boy, uh, baby was not thriving like the female. And so there was a point in time and my sister's life was hanging in the balance and they thought she was not going to make it. Uh, she was not going to make it a couple, a couple months more. So she was, the doctors were coming in and they were basically saying, you have to make a choice. You have to sacrifice one of your children. And we think that will then be enough for your body to recover. You'll be able to go full term. And then you and this baby that you decide to keep, um, the baby will be born healthy. You'll take it to full term. Everything will turn around. And my sister and her husband made the decision that they were not going to do that. They decided they were going to keep both children. And to quote my sister, the good Lord gave me these children. The good Lord's going to have to take these children. And so the doctor came in and he said, which one, which child are we going to terminate? And my sister said, neither. And he literally looked at her and her husband and said, you're being foolish and walked out. They got a new doctor. My sister, um, this new doctor came in. They said within 24, 48 hours, we'll know what's causing all of your, your illnesses, your sicknesses, your nutrition problems, and we'll have a plan in place. True to his word, it was about 36 hours later after he came on, he found the root of the problem. They fixed it. 
Um, my sister started gaining weight. Uh, her nutritional uh, problems were over. The baby started thriving. Both of them started thriving. Um, and she went full term with two healthy babies. And the doctor before who said we need to terminate one was saying the male child is going to have all sorts of medical issues and it's not going to be functioning like a normal child. And it's going to be dependent on you. And there's going to be neuro neurological issues and um, he will have a club foot and his spine will be curved and there will be, I mean, just a variety of things. And my sister and her husband made that choice and two healthy babies came into this world. And so I say that Jamie, because I know there, there's a lot of things that I put, I put stock in a doctor's opinion too. And I go to a doctor for a variety of reasons, but I also want to recognize that a doctor is fallible and the doctor does not know everything. And so I don't really hold this kind of discussion up to what a doctor has to say. And, you know, and I can appreciate that. And, you know, I'm, I'm so glad, I'm so glad that everyone was okay in that situation. But at the end of the day, your sister had a choice and she, she got to choose. Yes, I am going to, if, if this is to my detriment, I'm going to do everything I can so that my babies can live. And that was her choice. And she got to make that choice. And I'm so glad that it turned out the way it did. But if I'm choosing not to sacrifice myself for a baby that may or may not be okay, that should also be my choice. And that's what I'm talking about. But um, terminating the pregnancy is not just impacting the woman's life. And, and let not. me tell you, I am all for, I am all for a dad being involved in that decision. And if a dad wants to be involved in that decision, that dad better start making some choices to, to be, be with the mom or to be present for those things. Because I'm sure, I'm sure there would be a lot fewer abortions if those decisions were being made with the support or not being made because there was support from a partner from someone who is there and involved. I don't think that that is the, that is the norm. <laughs> I think that these decisions are being made and the abor abortions are happening because there is no support because there is no other party there to help make that decision and to be there afterwards and for the next 18 years. And again, without getting into the, the topic that we said we weren't going to be talking about for this conversation, I don't think it matters for my argument. I don't think it matters what the situation is of how this child is coming into the world. What matters is you should have a man's voice just as much as a woman's voice when, when trying to terminate the pregnancy, it shouldn't just be all about the woman. It shouldn't be all about, there should be more care about what a husband, what a man, what a father has to say about the unborn child than there is today. So, I know it's hard, harsh for me to say, and it's, again, you've given some really good examples, but for this conversation, to me, it doesn't matter how the child got in, you know, in the womb. But from that point on, I think you need to have both the father and the mother in order to terminate it. Well, and I can, like I said, I can see where you're coming from in that as far as like why, um, why that is is a viewpoint for you and why that is a perspective for you. I wonder how your perspective would be different if you were the one that had to carry a baby um, and you were put in one of those situations, if that would, if that would shift your lens, if that would shift your viewpoint at all. But um, well, I'm sure being a woman, I would probably have a different perspective. However, all things, all other things can being the same with me. I just happen to switch genders. I would hope, I think I would probably have the same thing. I would probably want both signatures to protect, to protect the child and make sure the father's is, is being recognized and being heard. I think it's important before you can just terminate a pregnancy. Um, I think I would still want, um, I would still think it would be important to have the dad's voice be part of that decision making. Well, and I definitely, you know, to be fair, in, in this conversation. Um, if I were in a position that I was close to someone that wanted to have a voice in that, you know, I'd be encouraging that, you know, you want to have a say in that decision, then go be involved, go and go and 
do the big gesture and make sure that you get to be there because because parenting <laughs> parenting is hard when you do it by yourself. It takes two people um, to do it well. And sometimes it takes a village. I firmly believe in the need for a village to raise, to raise kids today. So, um, you know, if that is, if that is the perspective, if you want to have a say, then go make sure you have a say, uh, make sure you get to be there for that. Yeah. There's still nothing that will, I mean, that's why I want to go one step further and say, yes, I think dad's, I agree with you. Let's join our voices together. All guys that are potential fathers, you should be involved if you're not. But I do think, well. and again, I'm not, I'm not for a big, big, big government. I'm not. But I think in this particular case, it would be nice to have one step further. That's, you know, laws or legislation that's helping solidify that voice for the father. Because again, I can be as active as I want to be, but that doesn't guarantee that what I want for my child, I'm handcuffed to whatever the woman decides. And so that's the piece that I think needs to change. That's where I think we need to go and say, whatever this looks like, we need to start changing it to say, you have to take into account the, the, the man, the husband, the father, before you make that decision. And again, as we've already said at the very beginning, that flies in the face of everything that we've, you know, we've heard for the longest time. And it goes against the whole, the woman's body, her, her body, her choice, because it's not. I mean, yes, the pregnancy happens within the, the woman's body. I'm, I'm not senile, but it's not just the woman that's part of that process. You know, this has been a uh, this has been an interesting conversation because it's the first time that we've tried to laser focus in on a piece of a bigger issue. Because um, here we are. I mean, literally, I feel like we've just poked around the globe of this topic. <laughs> and so it's uh, it's been it's been fun uh, to try and try and focus in on this, on this one piece of this. But um, I, I do think, um, I do think that I have walked away with something to think about and, um, and, and something to really make me reflect on, um, reflect on my viewpoints in, in that specific part of this argument. So, um, thanks for, thanks for sharing that today. Yeah. Um, and what I, what I liked about it too, um, is it's different. It's a different topic. Cause again, you and I lobby each other's opinions at, about <laughs> abortion as a whole, right? Like abortion. And then we go back and forth, you know, and it's never it, different. That's, I think well, that's the thing. It's like, we, we say the same things when we have that conversation and this is a totally different, it's a totally different lens to put on the same, on the same topic. So thanks for bringing so, that today. Yeah. So my hope for this, as Jamie is trying to wrap this up is, um, I hope whoever finds this episode, my ask is just exactly what you said. Let's it's, a, it's a conversation. It's something to think about. And maybe it's a different point of view on a very old and tired topic that we all have heard in the media all in the news but it kind of brings a little bit of a different lens to it and i hope people talk about that lens because i do think it's important and i do think it's you know men if you're not involved get involved and dads are men going to be dads um if you're thinking of the child doesn't need you in life you're wrong um it's it's really important to have both the mom and dad active in the child's life doesn't mean that the mom and dad have to be together but the child does need both the mom and the dad so um that's my little little outreach spiel but again great conversation jamie and i love this angle and i hope whoever finds this episode um i just hope you it makes you talk about it, it makes you think a little bit differently about about this topic yeah well thanks for joining us today everyone it's been uh it's been uh it's been a good one um we'll uh i guess we'll we'll come back again with another topic next time right next week all right <laughs> oh thanks bye everyone bye this podcast was recorded and edited by jamie and malin music by famous cats if you have a topic you'd like us to discuss please email us at roundtablemindset at gmail.com text or call us at 402-819-8999 or join the conversation on facebook at roundtable mindset podcast and never miss a new episode by making sure you like, subscribe, and share wherever you listen to podcasts. 
thanks for being our guest today. See you next time at the roundtable. And remember, your opinions and perspectives matter and are appreciated, but might not always be shared by others. And that's okay. <laughs>